and get started. All right, let me start with the announcements first uh, so that I can hopefully save some of the answers uh, to questions that I'm sure you guys have, but let's go ahead and get started. Uh, your grades for the first lab and lecture exams were posted yesterday. Uh, I'm sure many of you are hopeful to see the exams, uh, see the comments that I've made. Again, I wasn't able to make comments on every question that you got wrong, but I did try to uh, throw some information in there to help you to be successful. And I do want the exams to be a learning experience. So today after class, I will be releasing the exam so that you can see the questions uh, and your answers on them. And uh, if then, uh, so that you can learn from that. If you have any questions on that, I can be available this afternoon if uh, by email or uh, by Zoom appointment uh, to be able to discuss your exam. If you're not quite sure why you got the grades you got on it, I'm happy to answer any of those kind of questions. I want the exams to be a learning process, but again, these are exams that uh, involve questions that other students will have. So again, these questions are only gonna be available for 24 hours, basically. Basically from the end of class today to the beginning of class tomorrow. And this will be your only opportunity to see this. So if you do not take advantage of this, uh, there is no makeup on this. So make sure you get that opportunity to look at those things to figure out uh, what it will help you to be successful on that. Uh, the other thing that I, a decision that I made this weekend as I was looking at our schedule for this week is normally I don't like having assignments due on days when we're not in class because when we're on class that helps you to, to remember and to be accountable. Uh, but um, because we're online, it is something we can take advantage of. And as I was looking at the schedule, uh, we will, uh, the 30 point skeletal review, which is graded for correctness, uh, was due tomorrow. And technically tomorrow, we still will not have been done with the bones and bone features. Now you should be looking ahead, you should be preparing, but since we are online, I don't see any reason why we can't take advantage of that to help you to be more successful on that assignment. Uh, so again, if you've completed it already and you want to turn it in early, you are welcome to do that. However, what I've decided to do is to make your 30-point skeletal review, which again, remember, is graded for correctness, due now Wednesday morning at 8 a.m. Again, I want to maintain the normal class time, even though we don't meet on Wednesday, because once you turn in the assignment, once the assignment is due, I can then release the key because obviously I'm not gonna have a chance to grade it in time and get it back to you before the exam on Thursday. Uh, so I wanna make sure that you can learn from that because that's definitely information that could potentially be on the exam. So it will now be due Wednesday morning at 8 a.m. And again, you can turn it in any time before then. It doesn't have to be turned in right at 8 a.m. Turn it in whenever you're done with it. But at 8.05 in the morning on Wednesday, the key will be posted so that you'll have all day to look at it and make sure that you study that to help you to be successful on the exam. All right, our game plan for the next two days is really simple. This is our halfway point of the class, basically. We have to finish up our lectures today and tomorrow, talking about and finishing our bone information, and then moving on to joints. We have two days of uh, appendicular skeleton group presentations to do, and you have two more assignments due. Your unit nine review, which is still due tomorrow morning, and your 30-point skeletal review, which again is due now Wednesday morning at 8 a.m. Again, I've encouraged you to work in your groups. You're not required to work in your groups, but I find that uh, bouncing these ideas off of people is helpful and useful information. But remember when it comes time to answer the question to make sure you answer them in your own words. Uh, also, I wanna remind you if you're not taking advantage of it, Wednesday also is an open lab right before the exam, which could be something that could be very helpful and useful as well. Uh, Jeff can help to show you some of those trickier bone features uh, that can uh, help you to be successful on the lab and lecture exam and help you to understand the processes because Thursday, you have your test. Friday's then a holiday, so we have a nice long weekend. Please be careful, please be safe, please be responsible. If you go out, please wear masks uh, for this long weekend. Uh, but I also please want you looking ahead at the muscular system. What I will tell you about the muscular system is there is just as much anatomy on the muscular system as there's been on the skeletal system, and there's a lot on the skeletal system, but there is a lot more physiology.
So it will really behoove you. Again, the, you've got two weeks for this. This weekend is one of your two weekends to prepare for this next section, for the muscular section. So I want to strongly encourage you to start looking at the material and looking ahead. Take advantage of the interactive physiology on your Master in AMP, which is excellent for this part. There are uh, some excellent videos of the muscle contraction process in the AMP flicks. You have some great resources to help you to be successful. I want to strongly encourage you to take advantage of that, but more than strongly encouraging you, I'm going to uh, both carrot you to do it, but also stick you to do it as well, and that you will have two assignments due on Monday when you come back. Uh, the pre-labs from your lab manual, again, not the reviews. The reviews you're going to still do, you're going to still turn those in, but you are also doing the pre-labs. So pre-labs for unit 10, pre-lab for unit 11, and the page numbers are there for you. Those are due on Monday at the beginning of class. All right. I think those are all the announcements. Any questions on any of that before we dive into the material? Questions on the exam or questions on anything else? Oh, hold on. I have my volume really low. Let me turn this up. All right, now I may actually be able to hear you. Perfect, excellent. Questions? Yeah, I got a question. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Um, for uh, the exam, like uh, the 30 points uh, assignment that yes. is due on Wednesday, Yes. Uh, on the exam, are we gonna have questions like where it says, the feature of this bone connects to the feature of this bone and is it going to be pretty much like this or no? So great question. So um, first of all, yes, absolutely. Although um, remember, this is also material you're responsible for on the lab exam. So if you think about it on the lab exam, um, we could have a bone on the lab exam and uh, that bone may have a particular bone feature on it. What I can do on the lab exam is I could put an arrow pointing at that bone feature and say, identify that bone feature, right? And that, but I could also point at that bone feature and I could say, identify the bone and bone feature that articulates with that bone feature, right? So for instance, uh, I could show you the head of a humerus and point at it and say, identify this bone feature and you would say the head of the humerus or I could point at it and say identify the bone and bone feature that articulates with this bone feature and you need to know that that's the glenoid cavity of the uh, scapula so absolutely for our articulation points so that's one of the things we'll be focusing on today as we go through our appendicular skeleton is to know that but uh, as I've said many times, you are responsible for all the information that we cover in this class. You have a 30 point assignment that is due and is also graded for correctness. That probably should tell you that it is a pretty damn important assignment and things that are pretty important, are they likely to show up on the exam? Absolutely, every single piece of information on that is testable material. All right, and I shouldn't have to tell you that. That should be, again, you guys are sophisticated students at this point. You should be able to figure that out. Oh no, didn't mean to do that. Put that back. All right. Uh, where can I find the study guide for the exam? Well, again, remember the lab exam study guide is the bones of bone features that we've been studying and we've been going over through that together. Remember for the lectures, I don't do a study guide for the lectures because you're responsible for everything we talk about in lecture. So basically your outlines, uh, the lecture slide outlines are your study guide to remind you of all the things we talked about in lecture so that you uh, can, you uh, prepare and be ready and go for that. All right. Good questions. Any others? For All right. The, oh, go ahead. Sorry, for the exam scores, how much is the mean influenced by the zero? Or is that just an outlier? No, uh, uh, again, I, I know I know the exam scores are intimidating when you look at those numbers. I do understand and appreciate that. Um, what I would tell you is that one of the things that happens, and again, I, I post the, the announcement on Canvas, and not only do I give the averages, but I also give the high and low scores. 
I give the high and low scores not so that two people feel really good about themselves and two people feel really bad about themselves. What I find on these first exams is that I want it to, I, I, th I think it is important to show people a kind of what you're talking about. First is that everybody comes into this class with different expectations. Some of you have already attempted 430 before. Some of you have even completed 430 before, but maybe didn't get the grade that you want. So you have a good understanding of what is necessary for to be successful in this class. Other people, this is the very first science class they've ever taken. Chemistry doesn't count, right? So this is their very first real science class. And the way you have to be successful in preparing for a science class is very, very different from the way you can prepare for other types of classes. And some people just didn't prepare properly for them. Uh, and so I want people to see that variation in that because when you just see the averages, yeah, uh, the people who weren't as successful, the lower scores uh, are things that drive the average down. There were a fair number of people who were very successful. There were a fair number of people who weren't very successful and then the scattering of students in between. Uh, so averages are mathematically useful, but they're always not necessarily meaningful. And I think especially on these first two tests, they're not as meaningful. Uh, the one, so, but other than to show that overall the grades were not good. There were plenty of people who did well. Uh, there were other people who weren't as successful, but um, I think a lot of people weren't as successful as they wanted to be for whatever reason. They didn't prepare properly. It's the format of being online, uh, hadn't taken a real science class before. There's lots of reasons for that. The good news is there is still some time to improve on that. And so uh, I really want these first tests to be a learning experience for those of you who weren't as successful. Uh, again, if you weren't as successful as you want to be, uh, one of the keys is not to beat yourself up, don't go home and flog yourself as a result of this, but to realize that you have to change the way that you're attacking this material and move forward from that. And if you're not sure how to do that, uh, then contact me, right? Email me, meet with me on Zoom. Let's talk about this so that I can help you to be successful. And now's the time when you want to do that because we're only 25% of the way into the points of this class, or about a third to 25% into the points, so there's still time to make a difference, right? Uh, when people come up to me the day before the final exam and say, what can I do to change my grade? The answer at that point is pretty much nothing, because all the points are in the book, right? Now is the time where significant changes in how you're attacking this material can have significant changes on your grades moving forward. Like I said, the one bright lining to this is that while the test scores are bad, there's just no way around it, the, the average is bad, um, the good news is your points in this class are not based just on the exams. Your points are based on every single point uh, that is turned in, and all the points count the same. 10 points on a lab exam counts the same as 10 points on a homework assignment, count the same as 10 points on one of the lab activities, right, as in a unit review. So that is one of the reasons why it is vitally important to make sure you're turning in your homework, turning them in on time, right? Again, that, that unit reviews are basically an excuse to study. I'm giving you free points for studying as long as you're putting the time and the effort. So when you don't turn them in or when you turn them in late, you are giving away free points. And those points make a huge difference in your grade. The good news is right now, the average in the class overall is about 73. So while those lecture scores were a lot lower, the one nice thing about this online format, especially the first part of this online format, is there was a lot more busy work that you guys had to do, hoops you had to jump through, things like that that you got points for, and that did help to boost the get grades a little bit. So we are still, so we're now somewhere around, like I said, I think the average is a little over 73, just under 74%, which is not a bad place to be after the first exam. However, moving forward, there isn't as much busy work. So your exams are gonna become much, much more important. All right? So have the exams been curved? Yes, so I did, I did curve them. Uh, with Proctorio, because of the way that, uh, the way I curve them in classes in, in, an, um, in the home, I mean in the on-campus class is different from the way I have to curve them here. Uh, so normally I lower the grade points, you know, so like based on what the top score was and things along those lines. Uh, in this, what I do, if you look in your exam, you'll see at the bottom of the exam, there's what Proctorio calls their fudge points or something like that. 
So uh, for the uh, for the lab exam, I think it was three or four points that everybody got as part of the curve. And for the lecture, I think it was five or six points that were added to everyone. I don't remember the exact number that it worked out to, but it's something like that. Um, that were added to everybody's points. So everybody did get a little bit of a boost because of the curve. So yes, they were curved a little bit because of, uh, and you will see that at the bottom of your score. All right. All right, hold on, there's a couple more questions. Uh, list of bones and bone features for studying, or do we know it through the lecture? No, uh, there, again, in your module, there is a list of bone and bone features under the lab handouts. So under the lab handouts is where you will find uh, the bones and bone features that you're responsible for. And they're exactly the ones that we've been going through on the list. So uh, hopefully you've been looking at that. Um, okay, so great question, Nicole. So again, it is a cumulative class, uh, but for this exam, each, so th this class is divided up into four parts. For this part, uh, you are just going to be responsible for the material we covered in this part. So there won't, for instance, be any great, used a great example, there won't be a mitosis question on, um, on this section, on this exam, lecture exam one and two. However, some of the information from last one we are using, do you need to understand bone tissues, right? And we're going to need to talk about cartilages. There's going to be some membranes we talk about in joints. So things that directly we talk about in this section, uh, that may have been in the previous section will be things you use again. Uh, moving forward, a great example moving forward, as we move from this section to the muscle section, many of the bones and bone features, many of the bone features I'm holding you responsible for are articulation points. Those are things that you're going to be using on this exam. But many of the other ones are actually attachment points for the muscles. So when we get to the muscles in the next section, do you need to know those bone features that are the origins and insertions? Absolutely. And in fact, on the next lab exam, I guarantee there will be bone pictures where I will point at a bone, I will point at a bone feature, and I will say what muscle originates from that bone feature, what muscle inserts into that bone feature. And we'll actually be drawing those as we work together on that uh, in the next section. So there, so things that we use will be moving forward, but like I said, there definitely will not be a mitosis question on this exam. However, remember at the end of the class, there is a cumulative final exam, and that cumulative final exam covers everything we've covered in the class. So on that final exam, there will definitely be homeostasis, definitely be mitosis, definitely be stuff from all four sections on that. All right. Questions on any of that? All right, so the last two things I would want to, I want to say is again, there is still time for you to change and get the grade that you want in this class. However, you have to, for some of you, you're gonna to have to change the way you're studying. Now, the one advantage that you have is that, as I've said many, many times, this class is hard. And I love that because I don't have to be tricky. The exact same way I made this lab and lecture exam is the exact same way that I'm going to make all of your lab and lecture exams. So when I release the exam today, I want to strongly encourage you to take a look at it. Look at the questions. Look how I've graded the questions. Look where the questions are coming from. Are they coming from the lab activities that we're doing? Are they coming from the lecture stuff that we're talking about? Right? You should be able to see where the questions are coming from. Uh, and so you should be able to prepare better for the next exams. Now that you've experienced it, there's no more surprises. You know what a lab exam is going to look like. You know what a lecture exam is going to look like. And so you should be able to better prepare because the same way I wrote these exams is the exact same way I've written all the other exams. All right. All right. Excellent. So again, while the, the numbers might not be pretty, uh, hopefully the overall information is good. Uh, no, the final exam does not replace the lowest test score. I do that during the uh, uh, regular semester, during the fall and the spring, uh, because in the fall and spring we have five lab and lecture exams, and with five lab and lecture exams, uh, there's more time for learning. Unfortunately, during summer with only four exams, uh, it skews things too heavily. So no, uh, the final exam will not replace your lowest score. Every test counts. All righty. Any other questions? 
All right, excellent. Then let's move forward. Uh, there. Perfect. All right. So we left off last time, and like I said, we're still working through our bone physiology. We have talked about normal bone development. What are the two ways of making bones? This is the part where you interact with me. What are osteoblast the two ways? and osteoblast. Well, okay, osteoblasts make them, but again, remember we learned two bone growth processes. There we go. One of them is endochondrial ossification, and what was the other way that we made bones? Intramembranous ossification. Excellent. We learned about two ways of growing bones. What were the two ways we grow bones? Again, if I just wanted to talk by myself, I would record these lectures and I would sleep in in the morning. The point of these lectures are for them to be interactive. And these are the easy questions. What is one of the ways you can grow a bone? Okay, uh, so you got the right idea. One of the ways we are gonna use appositional growth and that growth increases the width of the bone. You're right, so I was looking for width, excellent. And of course, what is the other way? Well, you're right, we use interstitial growth to grow the bones in length. There you go. Two ways of growing the bones, grow the bones in length, grow the bones in width. But you guys actually provided me with even more information. You guys are absolutely correct. When we're growing in length, we used interstitial growth. When we grew in width, we used uh, appositional growth. Excellent. Three main factors were necessary for maintaining the bones. What were those again? What were the three main factors necessary? Hormones, excellent. What's another one? Test is two days from today. Exercise and nutrition, perfect, excellent. And we even talked about the role that calcium plays in maintaining the homeostasis of the bones and also uh, how bones can be damaged by that importance of maintaining calcium. What that means is of all the physiological processes we talked about at the beginning of this section, the only thing we have left to do is to talk about how we repair a bone. Right? So when the bone's been damaged, how are we going to repair it? Excellent. And if we're going to repair a bone, then obviously the first thing we have to do is we have to break it. So let's talk about breaking bones. Your book's got a nice figure that does a good job of talking about this, and it shows a wide variety of different types of fractures. But in general, when we talk about a fracture of a bone, we basically define them one of two ways. They're either defined as being open or closed, or what we also say is compound and simple. So what is the difference between a simple and a compound fracture? What's the difference between them? Excellent. Whether or not it pierces through the skin, absolutely. In a simple or a closed fracture, the bone does not go through the skin. It does not penetrate through the skin. So it is contained within the skin. That is why it's considered closed. Whereas an open fracture is where the bone pierces through the skin. The bone is exposed and can be seen from the outer surface, in which case it is considered an opened or a compound fracture. Excellent. Another characteristic that can be common of many types of fractures, because uh, they can use several different classifications. Well, okay, let's do this this way. Excellent. Um, so that is the simple classifications, open and closed, or simple and compound. You may use either. But as you can tell from the illustration, there are several different types of classifications as well. 
The first and the simple of this is a transverse fracture. As the name would indicate, right, and we'll just look at the diaphysis of the bone here, with a transverse fracture, this is a fracture that basically occurs across the vertical axis, perpendicular to the vertical axis. If we think about it, I'll draw a highlighted line here, red. Right, this is the epiphysis up here. This is the other epiphysis up here. This is the longitudinal axis of the bone. A transverse fracture is a fracture that basically is perpendicular to that longitudinal axis. Now, one of the things you may notice about this type of fracture is with a transverse fracture, it can sometimes be displaced. What does that mean? Is it the opening of the fracture is wider or? Uh, you are partially correct. You are correct in that in, uh, with an open fracture, a displacement will take place. So, however, it is possible for it to be displaced and still be closed. So what does it mean to be displaced? You're right, all open fractures are displaced fractures, but you can be a closed fracture that is displaced as well. So, oh, I like that. I like that term, misaligned, exactly. So what happens is you have one bone, right? And there's a break that occurs in that bone. And what happens is the two pieces of the bone are no longer aligned with each other. So when the two pieces of the bone are no longer aligned with each other, that bone has been displaced. All right, I think hopefully that is simple enough. But let's talk about some other types of fractures. This fracture that we see here in this illustration is what is known as a comminuted fracture. With a comminuted fracture, as you can see, uh, in this case, the bone is broken into three or more pieces. All right, let's go ahead and put our diaphysis back there again. Again, with that transverse fracture, if you think about it, when that transverse fracture occurs, one bone becomes two bone pieces. But in this case, what happens is the bone breaks into three or more, right? We often think of this in terms of a shattering of the bone. The bone is shattered into multiple pieces. Now, as we talked about, adolescents tend to have rubbery bones. You as an adult have big, strong, firm bones, right? Are those bones that are likely to shatter? No, as we talked about, uh, as we age, the bones lose some of those collagen fibers and they become more brittle. So this is a condition that is much more common in someone that is more elderly, where the bones have become more brittle as a result of that. So typically this is a type of fracture that really only occurs uh, in old age as a result of that um, brittleness that can occur with the bone. Now, again, we say typically, because obviously if you take a healthy individual and you take a hammer, a sledgehammer three or four times to their femur, you're gonna be able to shatter it as a result of that, right? But like I said, the type of injury hopefully isn't too common. Uh, so this type of shattering from a fall or things along those lines uh, can be very devastating. And remember too, as we talked about, as we age, the bone deposition becomes much less than the bone resorption. So not only does grandma shatter her bones, but it is much, much harder for her to repair them as well. So bone uh, breaks in elderly individuals can be really, really devastating. All right. A different type of fracture is what is known as a spiral fracture. In this case, as we see here, and again, this is where my limited drawing skills, I'm not even sure if I should attempt this, but we'll go ahead and give it a shot anyway. There is the diaphysis, and again, with a spiral fracture, rather than just a straight transverse fracture, notice you're getting a spiraling of the fracture on that bone. This typically occurs with an excessive twisting of the bone that occurs. Uh, this commonly occurs in uh, runners or soccer players. You're running across the soccer field, your foot lands into that gopher hole, and as it lands in that gopher hole, you get twisted. 
where you're that running back running down the sidelines and the linebacker comes in and grabs you and tackles you with a twisting motion and that twisting of that. Or sometimes this happens with adolescents, they're bouncing on the couch and they're about to fall onto the glass coffee table. So mom grabs and pulls and as mom grabs and pulls, she twists on the arm and that twisting of the arm can cause that spiral fracture to occur. So again, this is a common sports fracture or a from that twisting motion that occurs in that type of an injury. And again, my drawing did a horrible job of showing it, but here you see that nice twisting both in the illustration and in the actual x-ray that it is based on. Compression fractures, as we can see here in the illustration, are very common in the uh, vertebral column, right? What happens here in our vertebral column is that we have a block-shaped bone, the body of our bone. And the key to a compression is you have two opposite accelerating forces, right? You're ice skating or rollerblading. And as you're ice skating or rollerblading, you fall. Your feet go out from under you and you drop to the ground and then you hit the ground. In that case, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see that question. Does the periosteum help to keep things from being displaced? It can help from being displaced, uh, but uh, depending on how severe the injury is, it, again, remember, it's just a very thin, uh, uh, dense regular connective tissue. Uh, mostly there to house uh, cells and act as an attachment point, so it can't stop it from displacing. It's possible for a bone to be completely displaced if the force is great enough. All right, so what we have are two uh, opposing forces, that acceleration of coming down, that deceleration from hitting the ground, and these two forces, as it says here, basically crush the bone in between. So you get this crushing of the bone in between. It is very common in the vertebral column in association with falls. Like I said roller skating, ice skating, skateboarding, all of those types of activities are things where it can occur. It is possible for these to occur in other bones. One of the ones where, I'm, I'm not sure common is the right word that I would want to say, but one of the times where you will see this occur is in people who have attempted suicide and failed. So you hear stories of people jumping off of bridges and as they jump off the bridge into the water, right? And some of them die and some of them don't. The ones that die, you know, we don't really care about the broken bones on them, but if you survive, what often happens as that person is coming down and they come in feet first towards the water, right? As we know, anybody who's jumped off the high dive knows that surface tension of the water can make the water very, very hard when you do that belly flop. Well, jumping off a bridge, hitting that water is basically like hitting cement. And so what happens is they go feet first at that water and you can actually get a compression fracture uh, within the bones of the leg. So it's not uncommon in the tibia or even in the, fib and the femur as a result of that type of trauma. But the key to the compression is you've got those two forces from opposite directions. The acceleration downward versus the force of hitting the ground or hitting the water or whatever it is that way. I make a point of emphasizing this because compression fractures are different from depression fractures. With a depression fracture, the force is just coming from one side, right? Your wife has asked you for the umpteenth time to take the garbage out and you continue to ignore her because you're working on your TikTok videos. And as a result of that, she hits you in the head with a hammer, right? That type of accelerative force from just one direction leads to a depression fracture uh, from the skull. And basically what ends up happening is that the bone gets basically dented inward as a result. So it's similar to a compression in that you are squeezing the bone, but in this case, the depression is just coming from one direction. Again, as you can see from the illustration, this is not uncommon to occur in the skull, uh, whether from blows from uh, significant others or a fall or you're hitting your head on a on a, you know, raising up too fast and hitting on a shelf or any number of other things that can occur. 
However, it can occur in other bones as well. If you see your significant other coming with that hammer, you may put up your arm to defend yourself. And so then when that hammer hits the bones of your arm, uh, you can get a depression fracture there as well. All right. Oops, there we go. This fracture here is a fracture. Remember we talked about the comminuted, how it typically only occurs or almost only occurs in elderly. Well, obviously an epiphyseal fracture can only occur in someone who has an epiphyseal plate. So this is typically an adolescent or at least someone who's under 18 years of age. As we've talked about, we've looked at the bone, the long bone and its anatomy. We have the epiphysis, we have the diaphysis sitting on top of it. And as we know, we have that chunk of hyaline cartilage that is the epiphyseal plate where our bone is growing in length. That epiphyseal plate is hyaline cartilage. The rest of this is all bone and bone is harder than hyaline cartilage. Island cartilage is a softer, more malleable tissue. So a blow uh, that to the neck of the bone can actually cause the bone to break at that epiphyseal plate instead of breaking the bone. Now, this is not thankfully too common of a fracture, but why does it become a major concern if this type of fracture does occur? Why might this be? Yeah, absolutely, because what can happen is we'll learn about the growth process and the healing process of this. The major concern that goes along with this is as it heals, this epiphyseal plate may be ossified prematurely. And if it ossifies prematurely, then what happens is that bone stops growing in length. So now you have one humerus with two growth plates that are growing actively. And in the other humerus, you only have one growth plate. So obviously what's gonna happen is you're wearing, right, custom-made shirts for the rest of your life, right? And if it happens in the leg, it can be even more ish a serious of an issue. A change in the length of your legs, you're gonna have to wear special shoes with heels and things along those lines. It can dramatically affect your gait if this occurs early enough. So typically these types of breaks are monitored much more closely uh, by the doctors when they occur. Unfortunately, there isn't a whole lot that can be done about it if that does occur, uh, but they will typically monitor it more closely. And obviously this can only occur in an epiphyseal plate, so it can only, can only occur in adolescents who are still growing. Our last specific classification of fracture is another one that also only occurs in adolescence, and it is called a green stick fracture. The reason it's called a green stick fracture is because it kind of has to do with that sapling that's outside, right? Here it is the 4th of July weekend, so of course you're required by law to make s'mores. And if you go into your backyard to make, you know, get the sticks off the trees to make s'mores, do you go to that young sapling and grab one of the fresh limbs off of that to try to snap that off and make that your stick for the, uh, for the, um, for the s'mores? Is it easy to break a young limb off of a sapling tree? These are the easy question, folks. I know we're all quarantined inside, but hopefully you guys have still gone outside and seen trees. No, of course not, right? It doesn't snap easily. In fact, it bends. It's incredibly flexible. And in fact, if you keep working on it, what ends up starting to happen to it as you continue to work on it? What happens to the fibers of that branch? They start splitting. Yeah, they start to kind of shred as a result of that as you're twisting on it. That's because of all the flexibility and give. Well, that's exactly what happens with a green stick fracture. Remember, this is common in children. Their bone has more collagen. There has, it has less bone matrix in it. So it's more bendable. It's more flexible. So what happens, and let me change colors so we can see this a little more clearly. A force of pressure is put on the bone that would normally cause the bone to break. 
And what will happen is the bone will start to break. We will get a partial fracture of the bone that will occur because of the forces that are being put on that. But because of the flexibility and the give of the bone, what happens with the other side of the bone, because it's flexible, because it gives, is the other side of the bone basically is able to compress. So on one side, we get a break, but on the other side, we get a compression of the bone. And that compression doesn't cause it to fra the fracture to go all the way through. So it's only a partial break that only goes part of the way through. And just like those green sticks, those limbs of the saplings, you can actually get a shredding of the bone uh, coming off of this part as well as it occurs. So again, this picture, uh, this is blown up really big from the picture in your textbook. The resolution is much better in the textbook. But you can actually, if you look at this in your textbook, you can actually see the shredding of the bone that is occurring because that part is breaking apart and shredding while it is compressing on the other side. All right. Questions on that? All right, so those are all of the specific types of fractures that uh, you are going to be responsible for. But if we've learned anything in this class, it's that doctors, anatomists love to name everything. So what they've actually done with, in many instances is they've taken these specific types of fractures, and if they commonly occur in a particular reason from a particular type of injury, they tend to give it a special name. One example of this is this one right here, a Coles fracture. A Coles fracture, and again, let's be precise in our definition of this. A Coles fracture is a fracture that occurs in the distal, uh, let's say it this way, not in, but near the distal epiphysis. of the radius and the ulna. So let's say it would be more. It occurs, it is a transverse fracture. Of the diaphysis. That occurs near the distal epiphyses of the radius and ulna. And it occurs in response to trying to catch yourself when you fall. So what happens is you're rollerblading, you're skateboarding, right? Uh, you get shoved from behind, and as you fall forward, you put your hands out. And as you put your hands out to catch yourself as you fall, what happens is you get a transverse fracture near the distal epiphyses of the radius and the ulna. And that fracture that occurs from catching yourself that way uh, uh, is called a Coles fracture. Right. Now notice it is of the radius and the ulna. We did put and ulna, but let's put and ulna in parentheses. Typically when it occurs, it affects both bones, but to be considered a Coles fracture, it has to at least involve the radius. So when you catch yourself from falling and you break the bones as a result of that, they consider that and they call that a Coles fracture. All right. Again, a pretty elaborate specific definition for that specific break, but it gets even better than that. My favorite special break is a POTS fracture. A POTS fracture, as you can see here, is a spiral fracture uh, that involves both the tibia and the fibula from the twisting or turning of the foot from either something like stepping in a hole or in the case of what actually happened here, stepping off the edge of a curb. A young gentleman was walking down the street, talking to some colleagues of his. And as he was talking in an animated discussion with these individuals, he stepped on the edge of the curve. 
and as he stepped on the edge of the curb, it caused his foot to twist and fall as he fell off of that, breaking his both tibia and fibula near the distal epiphysis, causing that spiral fracture. And as he laid there writhing in pain, he thought, hey, you know what? This would be a really good thing to write up for a medical journal. And so Dr. Potts wrote up his experience for a medical journal, and they named the fracture after him. So the Potts fracture is actually named off the individual that actually broke his leg doing that, that spiral fracture from stepping off a curb who then decided to write it up for a medical journal. And they named it after him. All right, and again, there are dozens more of these. These are just two examples to just show you uh, just how fun and complicated uh, the field of uh, fractures can be. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. So now that we have classified the two major classifications, open and close, talked about uh, different specific classifications of fractures and a couple special fractures, now that we've broken the bones, our goal is going to be to heal the bone. All right, so we have to heal the bone. Now, obviously, the way we heal the bone, different types of fractures are going to occur in different types of ways. But again, like usual, we'll use our long bone as an example, and we'll talk about a simple a transverse fracture, talking about the basic, most simplest kind to be able to do that. And like we've done in the past, let's do this twice. Let's do this once with me drawing it, and then we will do it once again with all the pretty pictures from your textbook. All right, now the first thing we need to do is we need to draw our bone. Now this is a long bone, but in the interest of, oh wait, no, I don't want red. In the interest of space, I'm only gonna draw half of it. So there is our uh, diaphysis. And then up here is our epiphysis. So there is our long bone. All right. And we're gonna do a simple transverse fracture. So we will do that and do that to break it and we'll put that in there and we'll put that in there. Excellent. All right. This is sort of our bone. Although not exactly, because there are a couple things we haven't drawn yet. And one of those things we haven't drawn at, one of those things that you guys mentioned earlier, so let's use green for this, is that there is a periosteum on the outer surface. Is it possible that the periosteum could still be intact as a result of the injury? Sure. Could it also be torn as a, uh, as in response to that? Absolutely. Uh, but let's say in this case, it's still intact. Now here I've put it in place kind of where it would be tight against the bone. I'm gonna cheat and move it out more here so we have a little bit more uh, room to play. And most importantly, so that we can put those immature cells that we know that are located here in our periosteum like those mesenchymal cells. Let's make that smaller so I have more room to play with. That works. All righty. So this is our starting point. Any questions on this? All right, now obviously one of the first things that happens when a bone breaks, as we know, is that bone is highly vascularized. So when the bone breaks, one of the things that happens is our blood vessels are ruptured. There are a couple effects that occur because of that. 
Obviously, when the blood vessel ruptures, uh, those blood vessels are going to bleed, and we're gonna get a large swelling of blood in this area. And what would we call such a large swelling of blood that occur accumulates in an area? Hematoma, perfect. So it forms what we call a hematoma. We form that form a hematoma. So let's draw that with my highlighter, put a little red in here. It becomes swollen, it becomes painful. What is the advantage of it actually becoming swollen and painful? It's not a trick question. Why is it useful that this injury has become swollen and painful? Does it lock the fracture into place better if it becomes like it becomes tighter somehow? Uh, not necessarily, although it will eventually, but yeah, part of it is so that exactly you're aware of the fact that you're injured. If you break your leg and it's swollen and it's painful, are you likely to go run a 5k race? Probably not because it'd be too painful. And so, yeah, you're not going to increase the severity of it. However, that doesn't mean that it doesn't get more severe because there's another effect that occurs with disruption, disrupting the blood flow. Right, when blood vessels burst, we disrupt the blood flow. And so as a result of that, some additional bone tissue will die. Obviously the bone that has been damaged, you're gonna get dead cells as a result of that. But if you think also by disrupting the blood flow in this area, what's going to end up happening is that there are going to be chunks of the bone that end up dying where the osteocytes are now no longer able to get the oxygen and the nutrients that they need. And as a result of it, there are going to be chunks of blood that die as a result of it. So there's going to be some damage to the bone not that occurs not just because of the break, but not only did it is the break that causes damage, but also the disruption of blood flow that causes damage as well. All right. Questions on that? All right, excellent. So now we have our injury, but now we have to start the healing process. And luckily, as we talked about, we have these mesenchymal cells in here. So those mesenchymal cells in the periosteum become very active and form what kind of cells? What kind of cells do you think these mesenchymal cells are gonna to become to allow us to heal the bone? We wanna heal bone and mesenchymal cells can become any type of connective tissue cell so since we want to heal bone, what type of cells do you think are gonna form from these mesenchymal cells? Excellent, you are correct. They're gonna form chondroblasts and fibroblasts. Wait, what? You're absolutely correct. What we think should form is osteoblasts, right? Because after all, we want to heal bone but it turns out that's not actually what happens. What actually happens is that the mesenchymal cells actually become fibroblasts and chondroblasts. And let's think about that. What do fibroblasts make? Fibers, excellent. What do chondroblasts make? Cartilage, excellent. 
So what ends up occurring in this area, and let's go ahead and use blue for this. In this area, what is going to happen is we're going to start to produce, oh, no, no. We're going to start to produce this big chunk of cartilage with a massive amount of fibers, collagen fibers inside of it. And so basically we form what is known as the fibrocartilage callus, oops, callus, or what is also known as the fibrocartilage cap. A big chunk of cartilage is going to form in this area. And depending on the severity of this injury, this can occur really, really rapidly. It can actually occur within a couple of hours, right? Now, what's the advantage of this? Why start with cartilage? Well, if I'm able to make it in just a couple hours, and obviously this fibrocartilage is a rapid substance that I can make that is going to be able to anchor and hold the bones together. And as was just pointed out, we do we know how to convert cartilage into bone? Yeah, absolutely, right? So what happens is it allows us to stabilize the structure, right? This stabilizes the bone. And when it stabilizes the bone, it gives a then uh, a model for bone formation to occur. Now, you may not be aware of this process, but I know you know about it. Because often when someone breaks a bone and goes to the doctor, what's one of the first things they have to do to that bone before they um, put on the cast. All right, you were playing football on Sunday with your buddies, got tackled, and your arm hurt, but you're a man, so you can't admit that it hurt. So a couple days have to go by, and then finally you go in there. Yeah, and one of the first things the doctor does is he re breaks the bone, right? Anybody, everybody heard of that before where they go in and they have to re-break it or set the bone as you guys more accurately put it? They don't actually re-break the bone, but what they are doing is breaking up this fibrocartilage because you guys absolutely have the right idea. If I break my arm from being tackled while playing football, in all likelihood, that bone is slightly displaced. And with that displacement, if the fibrocartilage forms, that's going to heal in an inappropriate uh, orientation. So typically what the doctor has to do is break up that fibrocartilage, realign the bone, set the bone as you guys mentioned, and then once it's properly realigned, then that fibrocartilage cap can appear and the bone will heal, will heal appropriately as a result of that. So absolutely, you guys are absolutely correct. Excellent. Now, as you mentioned, we have this cartilage here, but luckily we know how to convert cartilage into bone. We know that our bone uh, chondrocytes in here will grow large, will die, will calcify. We know that blood vessels are going to grow into the area, something that doesn't occur in cartilage but can occur in bone. And during this process, we are then going to bring osteoblasts and osteoclasts to the area. All right, so let's use red for this since it involves the blood vessels. Our, cal our cartilage calcifies. Blood vessels grow in. And they bring new cells. They bring osteo sites, uh, pardon me, osteoblasts and osteoclasts.
These cells are gonna do two things. The osteoblast, uh, pardon me, the osteoclasts are going to remove the calcified matrix and any dead bone in the area. And our osteoblasts are going to make new bone matrix. Now, if my osteoclasts are chewing up all this cartilage, chewing up all of this dead bone and removing it, and then my osteoblasts are coming in and making new bone matrix, is the new bone matrix that forms here gonna be perfectly aligned, compact bone? Is that what we're gonna get as a result of this? No, we're gonna get this big, huge mass of spongy bone. So a big, huge chunk of spongy bone, irregular points in process, irregular bone is going to form in here. So what we're gonna get is we're gonna get the formation of a big chunk of spongy bone. And this big uh, chunk of spongy bone is what we call the bony callus or the bony cap. Now, is our bone perfectly healed at this point? Is it back to the way that it was before? No, it's definitely not back to the way it was before. However, typically at this point, the cast comes off. Why would we want to take the cast off now if it isn't fully healed yet? Is it to uh, stimulate the bone by uh, putting pressure on it? Absolutely. Remember, as we talked about, stress on the bone aligns and strengthens the bone. So we want to take it off now because now with that bony callus, it can handle a modest amount of stress. Now, again, the second the cast comes off, should you be out running your 5K? No, but can you walk around the house, walk around the block? Absolutely, because as we talked about, that stress is going to help to play an important role in the fourth step in this process. And the fourth step in this process is remodeling. The process of remodeling the bone may take weeks, to years depending on the severity of it. And typically with the bone, is the bone ever as strong as it was before? Typically when a bone breaks, is it ever gonna be as strong as it was before? Well, it's not as strong as it was before. In fact, in most cases, it's actually stronger. After remodeling, once fully remodeled, and again, different types of fractures, different types of bones, this is not always the case, but in a typical fracture, in the healing process, the bone is actually remodeled and typically stronger than it was before, meaning the bone is more likely to break in a different location than in this location here. Now, obviously, the remodeling requires two steps. Step one is, again, to use our uh, osteoclast to remove uh, the bone in the middle, open up the medullary cavity again in the center. And then our osteoblasts are going to align that, oops, no, there, are going to align that dark, dense, compact bone around the edges. And that's really the key to that. Often, 
and we'll do it just by comparison here. The after a bone, when a bone breaks, the outer surface after remodeling is pretty much indistinguishable from the inner section, I mean from the uh, non-broken section. So when you look at it from the outside, you really can't tell that the bone has been broken anymore. Like we're talking, you know, five, 10, 15 years after a break. However, if you do an x-ray of the bone, what you see is where the break occurred, typically the compact bone is thicker. So you can't tell from the outside, but you can tell from an x-ray. Uh, so again, uh, and, and unfortunately, sometimes with habitual uh, child or spousal abuse, you know, things that have been going on for years and years and years, uh, x-rays can be one of the ways to show those uh, breaks that are 2, 10, 5, you know, 15 years old, uh, because there will always typically be a thickness in that area. So actually, in many instances, it can actually be stronger than it was prior to the break before. All right. Questions on that? All right, excellent. I've done it with my crappy little pictures. Let's take a look at the pretty little pictures and go through this process again. So, uh, no, great, uh, oh, great question. Not necessarily, however, uh, <laughs> if you've ever seen the movie Gattaca, uh, this can be a process that can be used to elongate the bone. Typically when a bone breaks, the goal is to realign the bone with itself so that the bone basically heals and is the same length as it is before. However, uh, it is possible to break the bone and put a spacer in it. And when they do that, basically the bone grows together and you can gain, you know, maybe like a 16th of an inch or something like that. Like I said, uh, there's a famous movie called Gattaca where they did this on an individual. Uh, but in real life, they will do this with some types of uh, dwarfism. With some types of dwarfism, they will do that. They will break the bone, put a spacer in, let the bone reheal. But like I said, you're gaining a 16th, maybe an eighth of an inch at a time by doing something like that. So to even get an, an inch of height, it takes three, four, five breaks of the bones to be able to do something like that. An incredibly excruciatingly painful process you have to go through. But again, for some of these individuals, the difference between being, you know, three, two and three, four is a pretty significant difference. So in some instances, they, they have done it. I think it's less common now, but it was something that was sometimes used in the past as well. But typically the bone shouldn't be longer as a result of it with a normal healing process. All righty. So again, step one, bone breaks. We damage the blood vessels, bleeds in the area, and we get that fracture hematoma. Blood vessels burst. Uh, by disrupting the blood flow, some of the bone in the area will die. So not just the damaged tissue, but peripheral tissue can be damaged by a break as well. And the region becomes swollen and painful to tell you you've been injured. So you don't increase the severity of it. I like the way you guys described that. All right. But notice our periosteum is still intact. And even if the periosteum was torn, there is still going to be intact parts of the periosteum that are going to be present. And so like I said, as we expect, the mesenchymal cells in our periosteum become active. What we didn't expect is what those cells in the periosteum do. We expected they'd become osteoblasts. Instead, they became fibroblasts and chondroblasts. And basically what they do is they make a massive chunk of fibrocartilage, a cartilage with a massive amount of collagen fibers in it, that forms a fibrocartilaginous callus or that fibrocartilaginous cap that basically stabilizes the bones and holds the two ends together. And like I said, this can occur as rapidly as a couple hours uh, for this to occur. Luckily, we know how to convert cartilage into bone, and so that is what we can do next. All right. Our tissue calcifies, uh, blood vessels grow into the area, 
we start bringing in osteoblasts and osteoclasts. Our osteoblasts start replacing the area with spongy bone. Our osteoclasts remove the dead and damaged bone, and we get a big chunk of spongy bone that now completely fills this space. We call that the bony callus. And as we talked about, at this point now, the fracture is stabilized and can actually handle a moderate amount of stress. And this is typically when the cast comes off, because as you guys pointed out, right, we want to put a little stress on the bone so that as we put the stress on the bone, we using that bone, we can increase the density, we can increase the, um, the strength, and we can realign the osculants. And that's our goal now, remodeling the bone. Again, this process can take months to years, uh, depending on how severe the injury is. But as we also talked about, typically in that area, you get a thicker piece of compact bone. And so typically the bone is as strong, if not slightly stronger, in that one region than it was before. All right. Questions on that? All right, excellent. All right, so with that, we are done with bones and we get to move on to the last topic we need to talk about uh, for this exam and that is gonna be our joints. Uh, this is a good stopping point. Let's go ahead and take our first break. Uh, so for this break, uh, where's my, I need that. And that. All right, so we will, what time is it now? It is 9.11, so we will restart at uh, 9, 15 minutes, so that's 9.26, and I will start the recording at that point. All right, any other questions before we take our break? All right, I will see you guys in 15 minutes. All righty, any questions before we get started? All right, well then let's, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. I uh, did a web search for uh, rib cage and joints and uh, I'm pretty sure that's what this is. I think that's a manubrium and uh, so, yeah. <laughs> anyway, all right, let's go ahead and get started. So, as I mentioned um, a couple times, but I'll mention it again, one of the challenging parts of this section isn't that I think the information is inherently hard, it's that uh, the vocabulary is a little bit more challenging in this part. Uh, so we get some alphabet soup words that we have to be familiar with. And again, it starts right off the bat. Uh, again, our focus is gonna be to talk about joints. And when we talk about joints, again, we can also use the term articulations or arthroses. All of those are things that mean the exact same thing, right? Joints are basically the parts that connect the skeleton together. Our skeleton, as we've talked about, gives us a vertical axis, gives us that protection, but it also allows for movement. And that ability to move is because the bones have joints. And that allows them to be levers that allows us to move our body through space. And obviously bone itself isn't flexible, so what we need is to have flexible connective tissues that hold the bones together that allow it to move freely through space. Of course, the study of the joints is the field of arthrology and the study of the movements that joints allow is the field of kinesiology, which I know several of you are interested in going into. All right, now, much like glands, much like most things we talk about when we identify joints, there are two main ways we can classify joints. We can classify joints structurally and we can classify joints functionally. So as we've often done, let's do that again. We will start first with, let's use red for this. Functional classification. Whoa, what's going on? Try that again. Functional classifications of joints. 
Now, when we say the functional classifications of joints, I will tell you right now that there are three functional classifications of joints. And what we're talking about is really the range of motion that the joint allows. How much movement is that joint capable of producing? All right, so that's what we mean when we talk about the functional classification of a joint. We also, and let's use, uh, we'll use blue for this one. The structural classifications of joints. And I will tell you right now, there are oops, four structural classifications of our joints. Structure, as we always mean, is basically how they're made. So in this case, really, when we're talking about our joints, we're talking about really two main factors. What connective tissue holds the bones together? And the second thing we're looking for is if there is a joint cavity. So is there a joint cavity? And if so, um, yes or no? And what connective tissues are holding the bones together? Those are our two classifications that we are looking for. All right. Now let's go ahead and divide the page up and divide it unequally. Perfect, that'll work. So that over here, we can identify and describe our functional classifications. Now, as I mentioned, there are three. and we identify them by the range of motion they allow. Our first functional classification is what we call a syn, oops, arthrosis. All right, syn arthrosis. Anyone have any idea how much movement a syn arthrosis allows? Bingo, none. This is a joint that allows no movement. Excellent. That's pretty simple. Our third classification, well, let's actually just go in order. Our second classification is amphiarthrosis. Again, arthrosis, I-S is the singular. Uh, E-S at the end would be the plural. So amphiarthroses. Is this, and then of course, if we wanted to turn it into an adjective, it'd be amphiarthritic, right? So again, fun with vocabulary. As we already said, arthrosis means joint. When I hear amphi, what do you think of when you hear me say amphi? It's not amphiarthrosis. What do you think of when I say amphi? What does that phrase make you think of? Go ahead. Well, I think of amphibian when I say amphi. What's special about an amphibian? Now, most of you, I'm guessing, have heard of an amphibian before. Maybe even held one. Okay, one thing about them is that they're typically cold-blooded. What else do you know about amphibians? There you go. They don't just live in the water or in land. It's half and half. And that's what we have here. An amphiarthrosis basically is not an immovable joint, but it's also not a free moving joint as well. So it's in between. And that's kind of what amphi means. Amphi means in between. So this is a joint that allows limited motion. All right, limited or restricted motion. And so then, of course, the third is a diarthrosis. 
or singular director of sys. And as you, I mentioned, this allows a free range of motion. However, we have to be careful with that. Here in my finger, this particular joint right here between my phalanges, right, or this one right here, because it's easier to see between these two phalanges, allows for a free range of motion, right? I can freely move it uh, along that axis. However, can I get my finger to move over here to the side like this? I mean, I could, right? But then I'm pretty much going to the doctor after that. So while it allows a free range of motion, that motion uh, can still be limited by the range of that motion, right? Or again, we can think of it this way, the number of axes. Axes. I don't know, how do you, what's the plural of axis? Let's pretend that's what it is. Axes uh, for the motion. Excellent, all right? So again, notice this joint here only moves along one axis, right? Can't go to the butt. This joint here between my phalanges and my metacarpal, this one can go up and down and this one can go back and forth. So this one has more axes of motion that it allows, whereas this one up here just allows one axis of motion. So all of the joints in your body, and remember, as we talked about, all 206 bones in our body form at least one joint with one other bone. Although really it was only 205, what was the one exception, what one bone doesn't form a joint with any other bone in the body? Hyoid, excellent. So 205 of your 206 named bones are going to form at least one joint, and every single one of those joints as they form is going to fall into one of these three functional classifications, either a synarthrosis, an amphiarthrosis, or a darthrosis. All right. Questions on that? All right, excellent. Then let's switch and talk about structural classifications. Oops. And again, there are four types. Those four types are primarily distinguished by whether, uh, what type of connective tissue holds the bones together, and also whether or not there is a joint cavity. Now, let's talk about the first type. The first type is what is known as a synostosis. Our first structural classification is a synostosis. That name doesn't tell us a whole heck of a lot. So I will cheat a little bit. There is a common term that is used for these types of joints. I'm gonna tell it to you because it will help you to answer this question. However, you are not allowed to use it on the exam. If you use it on the exam, you will get it wrong. No partial credit. Right? As you'll see on the lab exam, if you put cuticle or nail bed when associated with the nails, I did give you partial credit for that. But this one, you know, for the common terms, you need to use appropriate anatomical terms. And if you use this term on the exam, I will mark it wrong. But I'm giving it to you right here so you can answer my next question. A synostosis is often referred to commonly as a bony joint. So now that I've told you that a synostosis is a bony joint, what type of connective tissue do you think holds the two bones together with a synostosis? Come on, I know you guys are all a little shell-shocked after these exams, but like I said, there is still time. 
trust me, if you weren't done, you didn't do as well as you want, again, it's okay to be disappointed by that. It's okay to be frustrated by that, but know you can improve and go forward. And by the same token, the people who did well on this test, they don't get to cruise for the rest of the semester. They can take satisfaction in knowing that they were able to be successful in this exam, but they just have to work equally as hard on the rest of them as well. So everyone can still get the grade they want in this, in this class. You just got to change your effort into it, but you got to give me something. What type of connective tissue do you think holds bones together with a bony drought joint? Not a bad guess, but it's a bony joint. It's a, there you go, bone connective tissue, exactly. Exactly, with a synostosis, we have bone connective tissue that holds the bones together. So bone connective tissue holds the bones together. There you go, excellent. Let me do that. Perfect. Now, we've identified structural classifications. Oh, let's, uh, how do I want to do that? All right, we'll come back. All right, see if it gets a little easier from here. The second structural classification is a fibrous joint with a fibrous joint guess what type of connective tissue holds the bones together All right fibrous connective tissue excellent Third type is a cartilaginous joint. What do you think holds the bones together with a cartilaginous joint? These should be getting easier. There you go, cartilage. Excellent. And then last is a synovial joint. Now with a synovial joint, remember the second part of our definition is whether or not there's a cavity. And notice we haven't said cavity yet. So in this case, our synovial joints have a cavity. And guess what lines or forms that cavity? That cavity is formed by what? What type of membrane? There you go, by a synovial membrane. Excellent. All right, so there, 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 excellent. Perfect, so far so good. Questions on that? Now, as we've talked about in this class, function and structure are related to each other. So do you think there is a relationship between the functional classifications of our joints and the functional classifications of our joints? Absolutely. So let's do that. If you have two bones that are held together by bone connective tissue with a synostosis, what do you think the functional classification of a synostosis is going to be? Is it going to be a synarthrosis, an amphiarthrosis, or a diarthrosis? Excellent. There you go. And like I said, 
this information in and of itself isn't particularly hard. In fact, it kind of makes a little bit of sense. If you have two bones that are held together by bone connective tissue, they're not going to move a whole heck of a lot. All right. That is a statement that is pretty clear, pretty straightforward, makes a fair amount of sense. All right. However, we get to be fancy. So instead, what we say is a synostosis is synarthritic. All right. Yeah, exactly. So the bones in the skull, the joints of the bones in the skull, have a synostosis structural classification, and they are, well, actually, we'll get to the, what they, 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 they don't start as a synostosis, but they become synostoses, and functionally, they are synarthritic. Absolutely. All right. With me so far. All right, because there's one more additional piece of information we need to add. Notice we talked about functional classifications. Oh, no, 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 you get to be read. There we go. Notice we talked about functional classifications and we talked about structural classifications. However, with our structural classifications, so let's say it this way, most of our structural classifications have specific, and I'm going to capitalize this, specific types of joints. So there is a third piece of information we need to be able to add to this. Starting first with our fibrous joints. As it turns out, our fibrous joints have three specific types. The first specific type is what is called a suture. Oops. The second specific type is called a syndesmosis. And the third specific type is a gomphosis. So there are three specific types of fibrous joints. Now, let's start easy. Sutures. Where do you find the sutures? Call. Skull, absolutely. These are only found in the skull. And basically, the way it occurs is we start with the two bones of the skull held together by a fibrous connective tissue. Fibers basically knit those cells together. All right, holding them together very, very tightly. And they're only in the skull. I'm going to erase the only in the skull so that I have a little bit more room at the end. So the bones are held together. So as an adolescent, we have those fibers holding our bones together. And again, as we mentioned uh, earlier, right, Ryan pointed out, as we age, they continue to ossify more and more and more until those fibers have so much calcium deposited around them, they basically become bony sutures. And when they become bony suture, technically their structural would be then a synostosis. Now, how much do the bones of your skull move around? None. Yeah, none at all. So what do you think the functional classification of a suture is? Synarthrosis. It's a synarthrosis. Excellent. Perfect. Excellent. Let's talk about a syndesmosis. With a syndesmosis, basically what we have is an interosseous 
membrane that holds the two bones together. Um, I'm gonna cheat a little bit here. Actually, I can't cheat a little bit here. Um, in the forearm, in the forearm, you have two parallel bones to each other. Anyone know what the two parallel bones in the forearm are? The radial and the ulna? Yeah, the radius and the ulna, absolutely. As we will see today, when we look at the illustrations, when we look at the charts, there is a membrane that connects these two together across the diaphyses. What it allows the bones to do is move with some limited movement, right? The two bones of, the, of your forearm don't move in wide range from each other, but they can press, they can rotate over each other a little bit. And so that inner osseous membrane stabilizes the bones, but allows for a limited or restrictive movement. And if it allows for a limited or restrictive movement, that's gonna be an amphiarthrosis. The gum fosis, aside from being the most fun of all of the specific types to say, is the joint that holds the teeth. Oops, no, no, not where you belong. In the jaw. Notice when we were counting the 80 bones of the axial skeleton, we did not include the teeth because the teeth are not actually bones. They are very bone-like. Uh, as we talked about, the crown is that enamel, which is the hydroxyapatite crystals. That's the same crystals that are found in the bone. On the inside of it is a material called dentin, which is very similar to the calcified cartilage that we find in bones as they're growing. So they are bone-like structures, but they are not actually considered bones. However, they're hold, held into the bones of the mandible and the maxilla by a fibrous connective tissue called the periodontal ligament. So these hold the teeth into the jaw and we call that specific joint of the teeth and only the teeth a gum fosis. All right, so those are the three specific types. And as we mentioned, functionally, this one, I'm just gonna put FC here for functional classification because it gives me more space. We said was a sin arthrosis. We said the functional classification of our sin desmosis was an amphi arthrosis. And trust me, I've got pretty pictures to show you all of these things when we go through it, but I wanted to do it on the board first together so you could see how all these things relate to each other. And lastly, how much do your teeth wiggle around inside of your jaw? None. Yeah, they shouldn't move at all, right? If you grab a tooth and it wiggles, then it probably means you're about to lose it, right? And unless uh, you've got a tooth fairy coming, that's not necessarily a good thing. So what would the functional classification of a gum fosis be? Synarthrosis. Synarthrosis, excellent. Perfect. So there you go. Those are our three specific types of fibrous joints and each of their own specific functional classifications. All right. Now, as I mentioned, cartilaginous joints are joints where cartilage holds them together. How many different types of cartilage did we have again? How many specific types of cartilage are there? Three, what were they? Highland cartilage. Highland cartilage. Fibrous cartilage. Fibrocartilage and what was the third one? Sorry, I can't hear you guys. Ah, there we go, elastic cartilage, right? Like the stuff felt in your, found in your ear. Grab your ear and wiggle your ear. As you grab your ear and wiggle your ear, would you necessarily want to have two bones that were held together by this? That wouldn't be very structurally sound. So not surprisingly, there are two specific types of cartilaginous joints because there are two different types of cartilage.
that hold bones together. Excellent. The first specific type of a cartilaginous joint is what we call a synchondrosis. Oops, no, 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 no. One. And the second is a symphysis. Now the synchondrosis is the joint where hyaline cartilage holds the bones together. The classic example of this is your first rib to your manubrium of the sternum. There, there's a chunk of hyaline cartilage that holds it together. Remember, one of the things we talked about with the rib cage is the rib cage isn't just about protection. You need movement to bring air in and out. I'm going to get back a little bit so I can do this. The way this actually works is kind of like, stand up a little bit, like the handle of a pail. If you think of the way a handle on a pail works, the handle on the pail has hinges to the, to the bucket, and then it swings up. As that handle swings up, the amount of space that in there increases. And that's what happens with our ribs. We bring our rings up, volume increases, pressure goes down, air comes in. Ribs go down, volume goes down, pressure goes up, air goes out, all right? So you have that swinging of the handle of the pair, of the pail, you have that swinging of the ribs. Well, you can't swing the ribs unless you have a hinge point. And that's what that first ribs do. Those first ribs connecting to the manubrium gives you that hinge point, that locked hinge point. However, if you think about it, we've actually talked about another location where a hyaline cartilage holds two bones together, the epiphyseal plate. If you think about it, we have the diaphysis of the bone, we have the epiphysis of the bone, and they're held together by hyaline cartilage. So that epiphyseal plate is actually another example of a synchondrosis. And let's think about this. How much should the head of your bone wiggle around on top of your uh, diaphysis? Should it move a whole heck of a lot? No. No. So the functional classification of a synchondrosis is going to be a synarthrosis. A symphysis is where we have the fibro, whoops, fibrocartilage holds bones together. The classic example of this is, remember we talked about that pubic symphysis where the two pelvic bones come together. We'll be talking about this, actually a group that's presenting this will be doing this on uh, tomorrow, on Tuesday. But our two pubic bones are held together by a chunk of fibrocartilage that help to stabilize our pelvis. Remember we talked about how the hormones that are released during puberty help to make that fibrocartilage a little bit more flexible than it even normally is so that mom can pass that basketball through that space. You think of also some of the other places where we find uh, fibrocartilage, the intervertebral joints of the vertebral column. Right there we have that, again, that fibrocartilage that helps to act as that shock absorber between the vertebrae, but it also does allow the vertebrae to twist and turn as you move your vertebral column. So while our synchondrosis functional classification, oops, as we mentioned is a synarthrosis, our, our symphysis, What's the functional classification of a symphysis going to be? All right, if you think of how your vertebral column moves, it's not a complete free range of motion, right? Your pelvis doesn't swing open like a door, but it's not rigidly locked in place either, so that makes it an... Amphiarthrosis. Amphiarthrosis, excellent. Perfect. Questions on that?
All right, so far so good. However, I hope also you're noticing one more thing as we go through all of this. Notice so far we are through three of our structural classifications. And notice all three of those structural classifications are either synarthroses or amphiarthroses. None of the joints we have talked about so far allow a free range of motion. It turns out the only joints that allow a free range of motion are the synovial joints. In fact, we can actually write it that way. All synovial joints are diarthroses. And it works the other way as well. All diarthroses, well actually let's put it on the other side. In blue. All diarthroses are synovial joints. So all synovial joints are diarthroses, all diarthroses are synovial joints. So that part's easy. That part goes hand in hand. We do have one minor issue though, and that is the issue of specific types of joints. Are there specific types of synovial joints? Well, I'm asking the question, so what's the yes. obvious answer? Yeah, the obvious answer is yes. Anyone know how many specific types? Four. No, yes, more than more than four, more than five, six. Excellent, there are six specific types of synovial joints. So clearly there's a lot going on with synovial joints. So we will save our discussion of synovial joints and those six specific types and the characteristics of synovial joints for tomorrow. All right, but this is a good start. We have most of the information here. And again, we have this relationship. Your book does a really nice job of showing this relationship between the functional classifications, the structural classifications, and the specific type. There is a nice handout that I've posted for you on Canvas under your modules, uh, under your study, uh, your lab handouts, uh, that again, there's no assignment on, but again, does a nice job of giving these definitions and distilling this information. There's a nice chart on that that kind of does exactly what we've done here. And most importantly, on the exam, I could point at a joint between two bones and I can ask you any one of these three questions. I can point at a joint and ask you for the functional classification of that joint, the structural classification of that joint, and the specific type of joint. So make sure you're prepared for that as well. Now, does that mean, again, 205 bones in the body form joints. All of them form at least one joint. Many of them perform two or more joints. Does that mean you have to know like the name of all 500 joints of the body? And for all 500 joints of the body, you need to know their functional classification, structural classification, and specific types? No. But will I give you two or three specific examples of all of these that you need to be able to relate to or identify? Absolutely. All right, we're gonna go through all of this again. We've done it here with the pretty words. I wanna do it with the pretty pictures so we can see that. But again, I think here's where we see it laid out most nicely, most concisely. So any questions on this before I erase the screen and we go back on into the lecture? So any questions on this? All right, excellent, stunned silence means Please continue, Dr. Slutsky. I've got it all mastered. And so that is what we will do. Clear that. And whoops, no, not what I wanted. Excellent. All right, so again, our functional classifications are how much movement the joint allows. 
We have our synarthroses that allow no movement, amphiarthroses that allow limited movement, and our diarthroses that allow a free range of moment, movement, but that free range can be limited on the number of axes that it provides. And as we said, our structural classifications, whether or not there's a cavity, and remember there's only one that has a cavity, and what type of connective tissue holds them together. So we have our synostosis, again, what we commonly refer to as bony, but remember I will not allow that term bony on the exam. Fibrous, cartilaginous, and synovial. Let's look at the pretty pictures of all these, talking first about fibrous, and remember with fibrous, we said there are three specific types. For fibrous joints, fibrous joints don't have a cavity. We have a fibrous connective tissue that holds the bones together. And they either allow a little bit of or no movement. Our first example, as we see here, is our suture. Again, sutures are only found in the skull. And here we see how those uh, sutures of the skull are held together by a dense fibrous connective tissue. As we talked about, the bones of our skull do not move, so sutures are synarthritic in their functional classification. But as we also talked about, if you actually get a chance to hold an actual skull in your hand, like the ones we have in the classroom, or if you go to Open Lab and Jeff shows you the skull, when you look at the skull and you look at the suture, what you'll see is that it's not collagen fibers anymore because all the skulls we have are mature adult skulls. And what's happened is that our osteoblasts have deposited hydroxyapatite crystals along all of these fibers and basically have turned that suture into a line of bone. So essentially what it becomes is a line of bone holding the bones together. So technically it ossifies into a synostosis. However, we still identify them at, by, as sutures by name. So ironically, when we talk about, for instance, the sagittal suture, technically it's a sagittal suture by name, but technically the type of joint it is is actually a synostosis. Again, fun with vocabulary. All right, uh, well, I don't have that. I'll get that chart picture for you guys during the next break. <clears throat> Our second type of fibrous joint, specific type of fibrous joint, is a syndesmosis. Syndesmosis, we have a ligament or an interosseous membrane that holds the bones together. Notice here, let me get my highlighter, we see a little bit of a ligament helping to hold these together down here. But what this illustration doesn't show, but we will see when I get the chart from the classroom, is that there is a fibrous connective tissue an interosseous membrane that runs along the diaphysis of the radius and the ulna, and also the tibia and the fibula, lower parts of our legs. These interosseous membranes form a type of joint we call a syndesmosis. These syndesmoses allow for a limited range of motion, right? Our two bones can kind of move across the surface of each other. They can be compressed and move that way. They have a limited range of motion, but the bones aren't freely swinging in relation to each other. Lastly, we have our gum phosis. After all, you use your teeth to your gum. Uh, so that's where your gum phoses are. Notice here, we have a tooth-like structure, I mean, pardon me, a bone-like structure in the tooth. There's that hard enamel, there is that dentin. And of course, we have the socket of the bone. In this case, this would be the lower jaw, so this would be the mandible. And notice in between them, we have this periodontal ligament. This periodontal ligament is a fibrous connective tissue that holds the bone of the jaw to the bone-like structure of the tooth, so it is a fibrous joint. And as we talked about, your teeth should not move along wobbling within your jaw, so functionally 
a gomphosis is a synarthrosis. Questions on that? All right, excellent. Those are our three fibrous joints. Let's talk about our cartilaginous joints. Remember, there are two specific types based on the two potential types of cartilage that can hold them together. It is either going to be hyaline cartilage or fibrocartilage. And again, they're either going to allow a little bit of movement or no movement. A synchondrosis is the one that uses the hyaline cartilage. And here we see those two classic examples we talked about. That first rib is held to the manubrium by a chunk of hyaline cartilage, making it the hinge point of the ribs, allowing the ribs to swing up and down. But the one that makes most sense to me is this one right here, our epiphyseal plate. Our epiphyseal plate is a chunk of hyaline cartilage that holds the diaphysis to the epiphysis. I know technically those aren't two bones, but they're definitely two bone pieces. And again, we don't want the head of our bones wobbling around on top of the shafts of our bones. So not surprisingly, our synchondroses are synarthroses. Whereas, oh, and think of it this way also. When our epiphyseal plate ossifies, it becomes the epiphyseal line. When it becomes the epiphyseal line, it becomes a synostosis. All right, this one's not going to ossify, but the epiphyseal plate does ossify into the epiphyseal line. And when it becomes an epiphyseal line, you have a thin line of compact bone holding the head to the shaft, and then technically it's a synostosis. So epiphyseal plate, synchondrosis, epiphyseal line, synostosis. Again, fun with vocabulary. Lastly, we have our pubic symphysis, where we have a chunk of hyaline cartilage holding the two uh, pubic bones together to form our pelvis. Remember, we also talked about those intervertebral discs uh, and those uh, form uh, syntheses as well, where we have the fibrocartilage that holds them together. Notice pubic symphysis, uh, intervertebral discs, they're all on the midline of the body. All of our symphyses are on the midline of the body. So those intervertebral joints, the pubic symphyses are there. And again, they're going to allow a limited range of motion. So they are going to be amphiarthroses. And lastly, as I mentioned, there are six specific types of synovial joints. Notice the articulating surfaces are very, very distinct in their shape and therefore are going to be very, very distinct in the movement they are going to allow. But we have to build up to this. We have to talk first about what a synovial joint is, the characteristics of the synovial joint, the characteristics they all share, accessory structures, and then we'll be able to talk about these specific, and even the movements they allow. And then we'll be able to talk about these specific types. We obviously have a lot of elaborate uh, synovial joints, some incredibly elaborate ones like the hip, like the shoulder, like the jaw that we could spend a lot of time on. I am going to hold you respons responsible for the anatomy of one specific joint, and that one specific joint will be the knee. So again, you have a handout on uh, your, um, in your uh, lab handouts, uh, that is the uh, anatomy of the knee that you're gonna be responsible for as well. And I guarantee you'll get at least one question on the knee on the exam, if not more. Again, it's random, so I don't have a precise say, but I guarantee you will have some knee questions uh, that you will have to answer on that. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. With that, that is everything that I wanted to cover from a lecture standpoint. Uh, we are getting to finish a lecture a little bit early because we have a lot of anatomy to work on today. So this gives us, this will give us uh, two hours for that. Now let's go ahead and take a 20 minute break. I will break you guys up in your groups again if you want a little bit of preparation for that. So it'll take me a few minutes to do that. But what we will do is, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording now when we're done.
two bones that make up the sh shoulder girdle. Uh, the point I want to emphasize that we see here is remember the job of the pectoral girdle is to connect the arm to the axial skeleton. And if you notice, the only place where that occurs is right here. The end of the clavicle connects to the manubrium. That's the only a bony attachment of the upper arm to your axial skeleton. All right? The advantage of that is we have a huge range of motion with our arm. It gives us tremendous dexterity. But what we lose is structure and strength, right? Think of it this way. How long can you stand for? John, someone give me a number. How long are you capable of standing for? Hours. Hours, absolutely, right? You could be waiting tables for an eight hour shift and you can stand forever, holding your entire weight up, right? How long can you hold yourself in a planking position for? All right, anybody here planked before? How long can you plank for? Holding yourself up in a planking Minutes. position. Minutes. Yeah, maybe a minute, absolutely. And if you think about it, you're not even holding up all your weight doing that. But maybe a minute, maybe a couple that you're able to do that for. Again, you don't have that structural integrity the same way. So it gives you great flexibility, but it doesn't give you a tremendous amount of strength. That is the advantage of being bipedal organisms. We stand on two legs, and that allowed our arms to become specialized for manipulation, for dexterity, because it doesn't have to hold our weight anymore. And that's a huge advantage, right? The other thing is uh, your pectoral girdle gives the vertical axis to the upper part of the body. Has anyone broken their collarbone or seen someone break their collarbone before? Just recently. You broke yours or saw someone? Saw someone. He got a butterfly fracture. Oh, wow. He just got the surgery today. Oh, wow. So what does it look like when someone breaks their collarbone? It's sticking out in the middle and uh, his shoulders slump down and he's cradling his arm. Yeah, it doesn't actually have to stick out, although it can sometimes do that. But you got the right idea. Basically, you break this. This is the only bone. Again, there's skin, there's, skin, there's muscle, there's connective tissues holding this together. So when you break the collarbone, it's not like the arm falls off. But it does collapse all inward and, and down and inward because, again, it's that only thing that's giving that vertical access. All right, perfect. How many bones to the upper arm? You got a picture here that shows it. How many bones in the upper arm? One. All right. What is it? It's the one that tells all the jokes because it's humorous. Excellent. How many bones in the lower arm? Radia and the ulna. Two. Yep. Radia and the ulna. Excellent. All right. How many bones in what we call the wrist? It's not really the wrist. It's really the base of the hand. What are these bones collectively known as? There are eight of them. And what are they collectively known as? Carpals, excellent. They're collectively known as the carpals. We'll see that's not truly what the wrist is. We'll actually see what the wrist is in just a minute. Uh, and how many bones in the hand? I've asked you this question before and last time we got away with a lot, but let's be more specific this time. How many bones in the hand? 20? Close. 19. Absolutely. Not quite 20. Just shy with 19. There you go. And we'll talk about those as well. So we've got groups that are presenting all of these bones today for the carpals. Not only do you have to identify the carpals, but you need as carpals collectively, but you also need to be able to identify each individual bone. Like the bones of the skull, I'm not going to have one of those wrist bones just sitting on a picture by itself and you have to figure it out. It will be in an intact wrist uh, that you will see those, an intact hand that you will see those, but you're still going to be responsible for that. And the same thing for the bones of the hand as well. You are responsible for identifying all 19 bones of the hand, but I'm not going to pluck one of these out and just have a picture of it. It will be intact. So we have some groups presenting those and hopefully uh, they've got some good tricks and mnemonics to help us to do that. All right, with that in our pocket then, 
I will go ahead and stop sharing myself and open up the screen uh, to our first group, group eight. So, nope, not the button I wanted to push. That's the button I want to push. Perfect. So when group eight is ready, they are presenting. I believe you've got both the uh, clavicle and the scapula, correct? You're, prevent you're presenting the entire uh, pectoral girdle, is that correct? Uh, I thought we were doing the tarsals, metatarsals, and phalanges, because last class you said that you were going to switch the numbers or something like that. Nope. When I presented these, I said I switched the order. Uh, you're group eight or are you group one? I'm group eight last time. Yeah, so group eight this time is doing the clavicle and the scapula. Did you not prepare the clavicle and scapula? No. We had oh, the we did the group yeah. one, what did you prepare? I prepared the tarsals, metatarsals, and phalanges. Okay, perfect. Well, then I'll tell you what. We will start this together. So, again, <laughs> let me share this real quick. But I also was going over the clavicle and the scapula, so I could present those if you need me to. Uh, if you'd like to, that'd be great. But here, let me, let me show the list one more time. So, this is the list. Uh, all I meant was last time we went in order from group one to group eight. Whereas I flipped the order, so whoever went first last time doesn't have to go first the second time. So that was what. So hopefully, hopefully that uh, I apologize for group eight if that was confusing. I do apologize for that. Hopefully the rest of you got the group um, and are doing the right bones. So hopefully group seven, six, five, you guys all have those uh, uh, accurate, and then hopefully we'll be able to go through that. But so let's go ahead and switch gears then, and I'll tell you what we will. Uh, so was it Alexa? Were you the one who said you'd be willing to? Uh... Uh, yeah, I can do that. Just okay. give me a minute to pull it up. Okay. Oh, thank you for reminding me to stop recording. Zoom.